Hi, Dr. Marume. I see it's just gone six o'clock. Should we just wait a few more minutes before we start? I think I think I think some some would join in as I, I can see people are joining in, but I think we'll just have to start. Sure. Okay. Um, ready. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone had a, I know it's tiring now in the afternoon to be sitting for a seminar, but thank you so much for joining us. My name is Professor Varsha Bengali, and I'm an academic at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. I'm a pharmacist by profession, and I practiced for about 12 years before I joined the university in 2011. My research area includes health system strengthening with a particular focus on health policy development, medicine safety and access. And I think just before we continue, I'd just like to quickly thank or take the opportunity to thank Dr. Amos Marume, who I'm sure everyone knows, probably doesn't need any introduction. Uh, Amos seems very big in Zimbabwe. So thank you for putting together this platform and also allowing us to use the Harare Institute of Public Health interface to host our Sub-Saharan Health Consortium. So just a quick background with, uh, with regards to the consortium, uh, what we are, so we are a group of passionate academics with varying uh, research interests that seek to improve research and mentorship, particularly in Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. So we're looking forward to hosting these series of seminars, engaging with you, and perhaps even collaborating with you in future. At the end of the seminar, we will be asking for your input as to what future seminars we could be hosting to ensure that this platform remains relevant and progressive. So today's topic has probably never been more relevant in light of the global COVID-19 pandemic. So without further messing about or ado, I'd like to quickly introduce our first speaker, Dr. Peter Yamoa, uh, who, will be, who will be conducting or presenting on vaccine hesitancy. Dr. Peter is a registered Ghanaian pharmacist who teaches and practices pharmacy in both clinic, clinical and academic settings. He has over 17 years of hospital, academic, community, and regulatory practice experience. Uh, Dr. Yamoa has an extensive postgraduate education history. I actually removed, I couldn't go through all of it in his bio sketch, but his most recent being uh, a specialist in pharmacovigilance at PhD level through the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, Dr. Yamoa has been a patient safety advocate, particularly publishing and speaking at international conferences on vaccine safety. He is a fellow of the African Collaborating Center for Advocating and Training in Pharmacovigilance in Ghana. He consults for various pharmaceutical companies on drug regulation, patient safety, and clinical trials. And he is currently a lecturer at the Department of Pharmacy Practice, University of Health, and Allied Sciences in Ghana where he is involved in clinical training of PharmD graduates, teaching courses including pharmacovigilance, clinical pharmacokinetics, and therapeutic monitoring, public health, pharmacoepidemiology, evidence-based medicine, and pathophysiology and therapeutics. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Imoa when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, as she rightly said, this is a, a very good time for us to look at um, vaccine hesitancy and ways of addressing vaccine hesitancy, particularly um, in this COVID era where we have a lot of people uh, trying to avoid vaccination because of a whole lot of uh, myths and misconceptions about COVID vaccines. So we are going to tailor down to COVID vaccines. And after my presentation, there'll be another one, which will look at ways of enhancing vaccine uptake. And so without wasting much time, I want to share my slides so that we can begin.
All right. I hope you can see. Yes, we can see your screen, Peter. All right. All right. So I'm going to give a background and then afterwards we will look at uh, vaccine hesitancy and then we'll narrow down to COVID-19 vaccines. Some of the adverse events following immunization that cause people to stay out of vaccination. And afterwards, Petra will look at ways of addressing this issue. Uh, my name is Dr. Yamo, as you know, I'm at the University of Health and Allied Science in Ghana, and I'm also part of this consortium. So this is going to be the outline of the presentation. We are going to be looking at a brief introduction and then look at safety requirements of vaccines, after which we'll narrow down to adverse events, following immunization and how causality assessment of um, adverse events in vaccination is conducted. After which we'll be looking at misinformation as far as adverse events related to vaccines are concerned. We'll be looking at a classic adverse event associated with COVID-19 vaccines, which people have made noise about. And a study is going to tell us or show us whether this adverse event was significant or not. Afterwards, then we'll look at uh, vaccine hesitancy briefly and conclude. I'm supposed to do this in 20 minutes and I'm hoping that you are going to have an exciting experience. So by way of introduction, immunization has been a great public health story and the lives of millions of children have been saved. Millions have the chance for longer, healthier life, a greater chance to learn, to lay, to read and write, to move around freely without suffering. This is a popular statement that Nelson Mandela made when he was the chair of the Vaccine Fund Board in 2002. And indeed, this is very profound because reading from literature as scientists, we get to understand that vaccines indeed have been very helpful to mankind. And so I have a few things to share with you regarding how vaccines have been very beneficial to mankind. And so we know that between the 1800s and 1900s, there were a lot of infectious diseases and many people died from these diseases. However, the introduction of vaccines made it possible to reduce the rates of infections associated with most infectious diseases, such as diphtheria, measles, uh, pertussis, tuberculosis, and many others. And so a data that I had from the US spanning from 1888 to 1924, showed that vaccines prevented 40 million cases of diphtheria, and then 35 million cases of measles, and a total of 103 million cases of childhood diseases altogether. When you put childhood diseases together, 103 million were prevented between 1888 to 1924 as a result of the introduction of vaccines. We also have other uh, benefits, such as reducing secondary infections that complicate vaccine preventable diseases, indirectly reducing the incidence of antimicrobial resistance. Because if we use vaccines and we have um, reduced incidence of infectious diseases, antimicrobial prescriptions will be reduced. And because of that, there'll be a reduction in the incidence of antimicrobial resistance. We can also talk about prevention of non-communicable diseases such as cancer. Cancer in the sense that it has been established that some cancers are caused by or worsened by uh, pathogenic organisms. And an example is hepatitis uh, B virus, hepatitis B virus, and then um, liver cancer. Some liver cancers can be caused by B virus. So, if we have hepatitis B vaccine to prevent 
this infection, then we are also going to reduce the incidence of non-communicable diseases like liver cancer. Other benefits are economic benefits such as cost effectiveness, vaccines are cost effective, and then promotion of health, vaccines promote health, productivity gains. If we don't get sick by vaccination and we go to work every day, then we are going to be productive. We can also talk about minimization of the impact of adult illness on the family. Now, some people argue that vaccines are not safe, but we as scientists or public health professionals have to educate the public because we are scientists and we know the process that drugs and vaccines go through. And so just as drugs go through phases of clinical trials, before they get approved, vaccines also go through clinical trials. So we have the phase one, phase two, and phase three, after which we have the phase four, that is the post-market surveillance. So phase one uh, trials evaluate the basic safety and immunogenicity of vaccines using a few trial participants, whereas phase two garner more information on vaccine safety and immunogenicity. So with phase one, we are looking at just about a few dozens of patients, maybe 10, 20, 30, up to about 80. And then when we get to phase two, we're talking about a few hundreds, maybe 100 to 300, whereas the phase three focuses on efficacy and safety. And then we have a lot more people getting recruited into uh, those uh, clinical trials. Okay, and then when the vaccine is approved, we also have the um, EPIs, expanded program on immunization, which are supposed to oversee the use of vaccines to ensure that cold storage is done properly where vaccines are stored between two to eight degrees Celsius, where they are also to ensure that during the administration of vaccines, vaccine or vaccination anxiety is reduced, multi-dose viral contamination is reduced, and so many others, as this can uh, cause adverse events. So when people say, or when the public make wild claims about the safety of vaccines, we need to educate them that vaccines go through clinical trials. And so there is some regulation associated with uh, vaccination. And we need to, we need to tell our, our, our people, our patients about this. So what are adverse events following immunization? We've talked about the fact that vaccines go through strict trials before approval. However, because clinical trials uh, take just a few weeks to a few months, there are chances that some adverse events will not be noticed during clinical trials. And because of that, in most cases, clinical trial data uh, has or have limitations in their post-market applicability. That is why after a vaccine is introduced, we need to conduct post-market surveillance. Pharmacovigilance um, institutions in our various countries must be up and doing to ensure that adverse events following immunization are recorded so that they can be detected as quickly as possible to solve it because adverse events have been one of the key reasons why people abstain from vaccination. And so we need to ensure that adverse events don't get escalated. Sometimes an adverse event may be mild, but once it is not detected and treated early, it gets escalated and it becomes uh, serious. So it is imperative to report adverse events for immunization to regulatory authorities so that they can characterize this and do causality assessment to see whether these adverse events are associated with the vaccines. So what is an adverse event following immunization? According to the WHO, it is any untoward medical occurrence that may present after the administration of a vaccine, but which does not necessarily have a causal relationship with a treatment. And so, a, a, an adverse event for immunization cannot always be linked to a vaccine product because it is an event. 
any event that occurs after the vaccination is recorded and it may or may not be related to the vaccine. The reason why this is the case is that people go into vaccination as healthy individuals and we don't expect them to come out worse off as against drug therapy in which patients are sick and because of that, we give them medications and sometimes we give room for some adverse drug reactions to occur with benefit and risk in mind. But when it comes to vaccines, individuals receiving vaccinations are healthy. And we don't expect them to come out worse off. That is why we use the term adverse event. And so anything that happens after vaccination must be recorded. And that is the reason why causality assessment is important. For instance, if somebody goes to take a vaccine and gets involved in an accident, it could be that the vaccine might have caused the accident or the person might have taken alcohol after the vaccination. Yet we need to record this as an adverse event and do causality assessment to be sure whether it was the vaccine or maybe some other cause, other risk factor, which led to the adverse reaction. And mostly AEFI or adverse event for immunization are temporal in nature. Most of them, they are self-limiting, such as fever, rash, injection site, pain, abscess. And occasionally you may have anaphylaxis, which is not common, but most of the adverse events are self-limiting. And because of that, they are temporal and we need to educate our patients about it. Sometimes it could resolve from unexplained causes, somebody or some people may react to vaccines because of their genetic makeup, all right? Or maybe they are just hypersensitive to some ingredients in the vaccine. You know, vaccines are prepared from active ingredients and adjuvants such as suspending agents, uh, preservatives, antimicrobial agents, and some people may react to some of these uh, constituents of vaccines. And because of that, we need to check. And so some adverse events could be serious or life-threatening. So any adverse event that leads to death, hospitalization or prolongation of existing hospitalization, persistent or significant disability or incapacity, congenital anomaly or life-threatening uh, can, be, can be said to be serious and must be given the necessary attention. However, these things are very, very uncommon, very, very rare. Very, very rare, so we need to take note of this. Why is AEFI causality assessment? I've mentioned that somebody may go and receive a vaccination and get involved in an accident after the vaccination. And we need to probe to find out because uh, if we are not able to do that, people are going to, people, people are going to lose trust in, 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 in vaccine because they will attribute anything that happens after vaccination to the vaccine. That is why it is necessary to do causality assessment. So it takes into consideration vaccine recipient characteristics such as existing comorbidities, history of allergy to vaccine ingredients, concomitant medications, time of administration of vaccine to time of AEFI manifestation, Coincidental events such as fever before and after vaccination. Somebody might have malaria before going to take a vaccine. And malaria is associated with fever, and the vaccine may also cause fever. So which, which, which of the two is responsible for the fever? We need to look at these things. And so there are two ways of assessing. We have the Brighton criteria which categorizes these into certain, probable, possible, or likely, unclassified, or unassessable, all right? Because of time, we'll not be able to go through this one after the other, but a certain, an AFI causality that is certain shows that the vaccine actually caused the adverse event and that there are no uh, risk factors which could have led to the adverse event. And so certain means it is the vaccine that resulted, such as uh, paralysis resulting from a polio, oral polio vaccine immunization. It is certain that if there is incorrect inactivation of the virus, it could lead to uh, paralysis. And so that is certain. And we know from 
literature that it can happen. So if it happens, we can conclusively say that. We also have the new improved Brighton criteria, which categorizes AEFI into consistent, indeterminate, inconsistent, and un unclassifiable. Now, we come to the main issue under discussion, the AEFI misinformation. It has been a major challenge, particularly in the era of COVID-19, and the key reasons have been exaggeration of self-limiting AEFI from the general public, a surge in the activities of anti-vaccine crusaders. I think that is a key thing, especially in the USA and in the UK. And then mis misinterpretation of AEFI data from open access databases such as VG Access. Most of the people who access these open access databases have no idea about causality assessment. So they just log into the database and whatever they find in there, they just publicize it. For instance, on October 6, 2021, conspiracy theorists in the US had or published some um, false claims regarding safety of COVID-19 vaccines because they logged into VG Access and found over 2 million adverse events. And straight away, they linked them to the COVID-19 vaccines without thinking that there is something called causality assessment. And this, there's a, a bad uh, past precedent to this. There was a doctor in Europe who published in the Lancet. The name of the doctor was Andrew Wakefield. He published in the Lancet in 1990 that the MMR vaccine, that is uh, uh, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, is associated with autism. And he was an anti-vaccine crusader. And this was one of the key things that led to vaccine hesitancy to the MMR vaccine, leading to the outbreak of these infections. So we need to be wary about these uh, anti-vax crusaders and people who are out there to throw dust in the eyes of the public. So this is a, a, a typical example of COVID-19 uh, vaccine. So in the US, there were reports of low platelet count, that is thrombocytopenia, following the administration of COVID-19 vaccines. And this uh, was researched into by the CDC and then the FDA of the USA. And according to their findings, there were reports of low platelet count two weeks after vaccination, all right? And they, they, they suspected that it could be immune-related thrombocytopenia, that is ITP. And so there were 20 reports of thrombocytopenia after Moderna and Pfizer uh, COVID-19 vaccine administration. There were 17 without pre-existing thrombocytopenia. There were 14 with reported bleeding symptoms prior to hospitalization. And 25% had inherited thrombocytopenia. Three had autoimmune conditions, including Crohn's disease, hypothyroidism, or positive uh, thyroglobulin antibodies, which all could lead to thrombocytopenia. And in fact, they, they, they did treatment for suspected ITP in 15 of the cases. And all of these cases responded well to corticosteroid therapy, but not to infused platelets, all right? And all these patients did very well. And so this, or this underlines the fact that uh, most of the allegations we had. There are many other studies that we, I, I couldn't include because of time. But most of the studies point to the fact that there were pre-existing conditions and most of the thrombocytopenia experience were treated with just a few deaths, which some were related to pre-existing conditions or underlying conditions. So these factors have led to vaccine hesitancy, as I have said, and it's a major problem in the USA and many other countries, including Zimbabwe. And it's one of the reasons that can lead to a surge in infectious diseases like measles and others. And so we need to educate our patients such that they will uh, go for vaccinations or they will accept uh, vaccinations. In conclusion, I want to say that vaccine provide protection against infectious diseases, and then
whether uh, there are adverse events and treat them as soon as possible so that people will not go out with some of these uh, wild claims. This will ensure effective monitoring of AEFI to detect serious and unexpected forms early to prevent injury, harm, injury or harm to vaccine recipients. Rumor mongering, myths, fears, and misconceptions on AEFI have the tendency to derail immunization programs and as a result, fail to achieve its intended purpose of disease prevention. Thank you very much for your attention. These are some of my references. Hello. Hi, Peter. Yes. So I, I'm done. And so if anyone needs further information, um, my email address is over here. You can you can contact me, pyamwa at uhas.edu.gh or pyamwa at gmail.com. Thank you very much for your attention. I think, Peter, it also would help if you just put in your details in the chat so people okay. can care recorded right. and will have access to it. Okay, thank and you very much. I want to thank Dr. Yumoa for such an insightful presentation. And like I said, um, he's very involved in pharmacovigilance and uh, Ghana is doing amaz amazing things and they're actually leading a lot of projects in pharmacovigilance. So if anyone is interested, I actually would advise them to contact Peter. I'm not sure if anyone is doing research in that area who, who wants to develop similar programs but it would be helpful to get in contact with him. He is, he is actually such a lovely person. So it's very easy to get on with and collaborate with uh, just from personal experience. Um, and I think our next speaker, Dr. Rueda Petros, is actually a perfect follow-on uh, to the topic that uh, Dr. Yamoa has presented on. And um, hopefully she can equip us with uh, the tools to tackle vaccine hesitancy amongst our patients. And she, as she was going to be pre uh, presenting on addressing vaccine hesitancy with motivational interviewing. Uh, a quick background of Dr. Petrus. Dr. Weda Petrus is a senior lecturer in industrial psychology in the discipline of psychology. And she's also the academic leader for teaching and learning in the School of Applied Human Sciences. She has been involved in health system strengthening interventions for the integrated provision of mental health care in low and middle income countries. Her experience in working with large research consortiums led to the development of clinical communication skills for people-centered care training programs for professional nurses in primary healthcare facilities. She has extensive experience in organizational development, design, and change management relating to health systems and employee wellness. So, Rueda, when you are ready, I should be let you can share your slides and start. Um, thank you, Varsha. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm just getting my slides ready. Um, okay. Um, can everyone see my slides? Hi, okay. yes, we can. All right, great. So my, um, I'll be talking a bit about addressing vaccine hesitancy using the skills of brief motivational interviewing. And um, as our colleague just shared around some of the reasons around vaccine hesitancy, before we really get into it, um, I just want everyone to reflect on a change that you've been wanting to make and what helped you make the change or what and what didn't help you to make the change. And if you can just pop that into the chat throughout, I will get back to it um, when I get to the to my section around uh, the change theories. Thank you. All right. So one of the biggest challenges that healthcare workers face is helping people change longstanding behaviors that are detrimental to their health and well-being whether it's related to a chronic condition, medication adherence, or taking a vaccine uh, to reduce severe illness, change is hard and change talk is even harder. Now, one of the things we need to understand working within the spaces that we do is that change isn't simply a discrete event, meaning it's not something that's a once off. It is a process. And oftentimes a crisis can precipitate a sudden change like the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So change usually involves loss as well as perceived gain. And during the pandemic globally, everyone experienced loss. And with the vaccine, it was the hope that some of that loss could be regained. So we all have been living with COVID-19 for the past two years, two or more years. And one thing we forget is that it has shaken the fabric of our lives. Overnight, the way we live, engage, work, and socialize has changed dramatically. The development of vaccines was thus seen as a Hail Mary, a means for us to return to some semblance of normality. However, despite the availability of vaccines, as uh, my colleague Peter mentioned, in Africa and globally, actually, there was a slower than expected uptake. And this is due to vaccine hesitancy as a result of misinformation. One of the things the pandemic has highlighted for us that work with behavior change and that work in the healthcare setting is that the things we took for granted, people's trust in medicine, people's trust in doctors, people's trust in vaccines is not always a given. And the pandemic sensitized us to how much more trust building needs to be established between the healthcare fraternity, um, the science community and people. So why don't people change? Peter mentioned quite a few reasons as to why people have not wanted, have not been keen to take the vaccine from a very um, scientific perspective. But what I'd like us to focus on are some of the more um, known things that we know that sometimes people don't change because they don't know. So we there, there's a, a part of, of ignorance on their part. And so what do we do? What is our natural reaction? We give them information, right? They don't see, so people are in denial. And then the way for us to sort of address that is we want to show them. They don't know how to change, so we want to teach them. And lastly, sometimes they don't care. And then our out of frustration, what often happens in healthcare settings or in any setting for that matter, is you give them help. So in order for us to effectively deal with vaccine hesitancy, with why people don't want to change, we first need to understand the process of change. And one of the models I like to use with my students is the trans theoretical model of change. It was developed for health beha risk behaviors, especially smoking. And it takes us through and describes a person's motivation and readiness to change a behavior. Behavior change is a process and it's not an event. So people go through five stages and there's a sixth stage, which is the relapse stage before a new behavior is adopted. And at each level, different types of information is needed to get the person going and thinking about change. So the five stages are pre-contemplation where you don't recognize you're not interested in changing, contemplation where you're thinking about the change, preparation where you are planning for the change, action where you adopt new habits and maintenance where it's an ongoing practice of new healthier behavior. Before the pandemic, none of us would have ever imagined that we would be wearing masks every time we leave our house. Yet, if we had to think about the change cycle and apply the process of our thoughts um, in adopting the behavior change of wearing masks, all of us were at pre-contemplation stage, contemplation, preparation, action. And now, despite the mask mandate being dropped, we are still many of us wearing masks when we are in public. And that is because we have adopted a new type of behavior, which we deem to be a benefit to our health. So behavior change is really discrete and a single event. And someone will move gradually from pre-contemplation to contemplation, to planning for change and taking action. On this slide, it's just an example. As I said, this model was developed for um, smoking intervention programs, and it sort of just highlights the different types of thoughts we have. Stage one and two is very much around the cognitive aspects of change. So what's going on mentally as you are preparing for change. And then the second three touch on our behavior, our actions. So they are behavioral in nature. Now, in terms of behavior change and getting people to um, be open to, to being vaccinated, communication is key. 
And research has shown that no matter how knowledgeable we may be as scientists, as clinicians, as psychologists, if he or she is not able to open good communication with your client, you will be of no help. So communication is critical when engaging clients on their reasons for wanting to get vaccinated or for refusing the vaccine. How we engage people is critical, is a critical component of person-centered care. So what is communication? It is verbal, it is the words we use, it's how we say it, as well as nonverbal, the way we stand and sit, the way our face moves, our facial expressions, eye contact, the gestures that we make, all of these are means and ways in how we communicate and convey our emotions, our feelings, our thoughts with our client. I really like this quote by Pascal, a French mathematician. And he says that people are generally better persuaded by the reasons which they have themselves discovered than by those which have come into the mind of others. Essentially, in a nutshell, no matter how much talking you do, how much information you give, how much scolding you do, a person is not going to change unless it is an internal decision that they have made for themselves. We cannot convince people to get vaccinated. We can only facilitate discussions and help to alleviate some of their concerns and fears around the vaccine. So how we do this is through motivational interviews interviewing because it is an it's an important method of encouraging motivation for change among patients and it's particularly effective in eliciting behavioral change among patients. So it's a directive client-centered counseling style and it allows patients to explore and resolve ambivalence. Now when vaccines were introduced there were mixed feelings um, not only from the general public but from healthcare workers, professionals, researchers, um, educators, professionals, everyone had concerns, and that was normal and natural. Allaying concerns and fears, however, were led to those at the core phase of the pandemic, our healthcare workers, who were not always equipped with the necessary skills to engage clients in change talk. And so before I dive into how we can base uh, uh, engage in change talk, I do want us to be very aware of what motivational interviewing is not. It is not a way of tricking people into doing what you want them to do. It is not a specific technique, but it is a series of techniques um, and skills which you learn with time and improve on in time. It is not problem solving or skill building. It is not just patient-centered therapy. And it is not easy to learn, but it is not impossible to learn. The more you use these skills and tools and techniques, the easier it will become to have more person-centered communication with your clients. And it is not the it and be all for every clinical challenge. It is not going to solve every problem that you face within a clinical setting, but it does help to facilitate conversation and communication. So what are some of the tasks of MI? The tasks or the aim of motivational interviewing is to engage through having really sensitive conversations with patients, to focus on what's important to the patient or the client regarding their behavior, their health, and their wealthy. So it, it reminds us to look at the patient as a whole and not just as this body in front of us that needs to get vaccinated so that we can reach our targets. It is around evoking the pers patient's personal motivation for change. So getting them to want to change for themselves, not for the healthcare provider, not for the, the country stats, not for anything other than themselves. And it is about negotiating plans. And often engaging in motivational interviewing will require you to resolve conflicting and ambivalent feelings and thoughts. And that's where the majority of people are. They are not against vaccinations. Many of them have been vaccinated for other conditions. However, they have ambivalent feelings, concerns regarding the vaccine. And therefore, it is our job to engage them in that conversation and give them as much of the tools that they need to navigate their own thought process. So how do we do this? We do this by embracing the spirit of motivational interviewing. 
And the spirit of motivational interviewing is collaborative, not confrontational. It is evocative and not educate, um, educational. It is respectful of autonomy and not authoritative. It is compassionate um, and therefore not condescending to the patient's own experiences. So when we say collaboration and collaborative, it is about developing a partnership with your patient, right? Sharing the power in the consultation room with them. It is about evoking the person's own personal motivation for wanting to change. It is respecting the patient's right to make informed choices to facilitate the change. And this is critical to the spirit of MI. You can give as much information as possible, but it, is, it might not be informative to the patient because it's not addressing their concerns. And it's about being compassionate and having empathy for the experiences of the patient or the client in front of you. And you have to have a desire to alleviate the suffering of others and a commitment to act in the best interest of your patient, whether that is getting vaccinated or not. So the five principles of MI are empathy, developing discrepancy, rolling with resistance, supporting self-efficacy, and amplifying ambivalence. Empathic listening has been shown to impact on a person's willingness to change. So by listening to what your client is telling you, it is critical in building that trust in order for you to help them navigate that ambivalence. Developing discrepancy means pointing out discrepancies and in doing so, you create a gap between where they are and where they want to be or need to be on, in their health journey. Rolling with resistance. Now, resistance is common. If we think about any change that's been implemented, whether it is personal change or in our workspaces, resistance is common when someone is asked to change. So our job here is to avoid confrontation, avoid talking down on our patients, but encourage, and in, but encourage them to come up with their own solutions. Support self-efficacy. Your client has to believe that the change that you are asking them to make or uh, engaging them on is something that is possible and attainable for them. And then amplify ambivalence. Ambivalence can be paralyzing. So acknowledge and explore it with the patient so that they can work through it. So there are a few basic skills which you can use um, in your daily practice. And as I said, the more you use this, the easier it will become. Um, and this is just what I've covered is just touching the surface on the literature and the information and the training that's available on motivational interviewing. So open-ended questions. When communicating with patients, do not ask closed-ended questions. So asking a patient, what do you know about vaccines is a way for you to gauge where they are at and what they need to hear from you to rectify that. So um, Peter was 100% uh, was, was correct in saying, you know, where people are sourcing information, there's rumors going around, it's misinformation. And that's one of the biggest things as a healthcare worker you would have to deal with. But in doing so, it is important to allow the patient to communicate that to you and then to be respectful of what they've shared with you. So, and then affirming responses. So, for example, appreciating that they are willing to share and to also sort of acknowledge what they've shared with you and reflective listening statements. So reflecting back what the person has said and making sure that they are aware that you are actively listening and paying attention. And then summary statements are key in motivational interviewing. So summarizing after a patient might have had two to three minutes of, of sharing something and telling them what you've heard and allowing them to correct you if you've missed anything. You are not obligated to remember each and everything your patient is telling you, but to rather engage in a conversation and a collaborative engagement with your patients or clients. So lastly, I just want to share something that we use when we are training around COVID um, and vaccine hesitancy with some of our um, students that are, are in, in professional placements. And it's about how do you talk about vaccines with people who may have questions or concerns? 
So listening with empathy is key. Acknowledging how someone is feeling. Asking open-ended questions as demonstrated by the ORS acronym that I've just shared with you. Sharing trusted information. So when a patient is telling you something which you know to be misinformation, make sure you are armed with information and only share it to, in a way that is supportive and not condescending. And then explore reasons for wanting to get vaccinated. So oftentimes it helps, and, and this is dependent on the situation. So, so please listen carefully here. Yeah, I'm not encouraging you to disclose anything to your patients that you are not comfortable in sharing, but based on the relationship you have with certain patients, um, sharing your own motivations and what helped you overcome any concerns may be helpful, but that is dependent on the relationship you have and how the conversation is progressing. So I hope that in this very, very brief presentation, I've managed to just open up your minds to the benefits of motivational interviewing, how you can incorporate that into your conversations with your clients. It is something we use quite often with um, patients uh, who are non-adherent to medication um, and to get them to self-manage and take ownership of their health and their health journey. And it's becoming more and more critical in addressing vaccine hesitancy. Um, thank you very much. And if there are any questions, please do pose it in the chat or address it to one of our um, conveners for this evening. Uh, thank you, Varsha. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petrus. Uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought. Uh, obviously, it comes across that motivational interviewing is almost an art, right? And as you said, it's something that builds with experience. I think in hindsight, well, lots of people on this platform are actually pharmacists, I think. Um, and if I go back to my own curriculum, you know, I find that this was obviously not something that was built into the curriculum. Uh, we did communication, but it's not something that I can remember. So perhaps more effort needs to be used or, or made to develop this in the undergraduate program. This may be a bit of an unfair question if I pose to you, but where do you think, you know, in a four-year curriculum that like we have at UKZN, I'm not sure about uh, the universities in Zimbabwe, um, where would this aspect of communication most benefit the students? Uh, I, like I said, it might be an unfair yeah. question. And but it's perfectly, it's perfectly fine, Varsha. Thanks. I think that clinical or communication skills. So, so my, one of my other um, sort of, as you mentioned, passions um, is around clinical communication skills for person-centered or people-centered care. So communication skills isn't a once-off. It is something you build and can scaffold on. So there are different levels and different types of communication. So I definitely think from level one to level four, we should be introducing students to basic clinical or person-centered communication skills. And then as they progress in, in, in their years and in their studies, you sort of build on, on, on some of the, 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 the skills of effective communication, which touches on motivational interviewing. But um, within our psychology program, we're very much about establishing rapport. How do you do that? What is active listening? How do you practice active listening? How do you summarize? How do you reflect? Because we're expecting uh, professionals to be able to do motivational interviewing in practice, but we're not giving them the tools and breaking it up into bite sizes throughout their training so that they are confident in using it in their practice. So it's from, I would say, level one, two, three, and four, and you're targeting different types of skills and different types of levels of expertise in communicating. Thank you Thanks for that. Sure. I think this is an obvious opportunity for uh, some interprofessional engagement and development, right? Because this is something that's part or part and parcel of what you do with your students. Right, so it obviously would be an opportunity for us as a pharmacy discipline to engage with psychology to help teach our students uh, yeah. such such a skill. Yeah, often I don't think we often use that interprofessional relationship and what we can gain from other disciplines. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm I'm not going to ask any more questions. I just want to put it out there to anyone on the forum if there are any questions for either Dr. Petrus or Dr. Yemoa.
So, so sorry, before we get to that, um, um, Vasha, if I may, so for those who did share either in the chat or privately with me, what they've wanted to change and what helped them make the change. It's interesting to note that there are some who, you know, in terms of this, it's uh, the change hasn't been done because either, you know, procrastination, making excuses or ignoring consequences or, or because of negative feedback. And so this is critical for us as, as healthcare professionals to reflect on, because if we are being or our feedback to, to, to clients is being perceived as negative, that you, you, you shut down that relationship immediately. One of the, 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 the nicest or I think the most apt quotes or feedback I received from a training on MI was when I demonstrated um, ineffective communication. And one of the participants, a professional nurse said, the healthcare provider was giving the patient the bricks with which to build a wall. And oftentimes we don't realize that we're doing that with the way we communicate with patients. Um, thanks, Vash. I see um, there's a hand up and I'll take the question. Yeah, I think just before I go, I'll let you take that hand. I just want to apologize because Dr. Morema has also told me that there are also medical doctors on this platform. So we'd like to acknowledge that as well. But obviously, motivational interviewing and the first topic is beneficial or relevant to everyone here. So I think uh, I'm going to take that hand from Dr. Nilaveni Padiachi. Dr. Padiachi, you muted. Hi, Vasha, can you hear me? Now we can hear you, thank you. Okay, great. Good evening to everybody and thank you for the lovely presentations. Um, Peter, this, this question is directed at you and I'm just, I'm just curious, do you think that in terms of clinical trial education, where we, we empower the public on what clinical trials are all about, and there could be a possibility that would improve vaccine uptake, do you think there's some sort of relationship there that we could improve on? Thanks, Vasha. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, I think you are right. Most, most of the public, especially in Africa, think clinical trials is like human beings being used as guinea pigs. I remember in 2015, uh, Ghana was supposed to run a phase three clinical trial on Ebola uh, virus uh, vaccine. And there was a lot of heated debate in Ghana, a lot of debate to the extent that if it even went to Parliament House of Ghana, where most of the parliamentarians were against the clinical trial to be conducted in Ghana on Ebola virus vaccine. So indeed, there's a lot of misinformation even with what clinical trials are supposed to be, even amongst the elite in the society, not just the illiterates or people who haven't gone to school. So we need to do a lot as far as educating the public on clinical trials is concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yumawa. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any other questions or if Dr. Marume, you'd want to say something. It, we've reached the top of the hour. So I'm not sure if you want to close. If there's any... I, th 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 thank you, Prof. I think there is a question from Gwenzi there. You can you can allow again, yeah. For the maybe for we can just say for the next five minutes if there are any people, anyone, anyone who want uh, to, 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 to ask something, we can we can give them that idea. Sure. So so, so Gwenzi, you can you can you can shoot. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, so I wanted to ask two questions, basically. Uh, thank you for the amazing talks and the presentations. So the first one was, um, I don't know if I should ask uh, both of the presenters. I don't know who will take the, 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 the questions. But the first one is, should uh, a, a general lay person be worried um, if a vaccine takes a relatively shorter time to be approved um, now, considering that, uh, for example, uh, Dr. Amoy, you've, you've, you've said much about um, the adverse uh, reactions and, and stuff. So these are things that come up with time. And so if a vaccine is um, actually authorized earlier, 
that, yeah. then yeah. Uh, we assume that there is a lot we don't know in terms of safety. So yeah. would that be a genuine cause for someone not really to be an anti-vaxxer, but to be someone who really needs information rather than to be grouped into the yeah. anti-vaxxers? So then the second yeah. question would be, now if the EU doesn't recognize vaccines that most of Africa has been using, like uh, for example, in Zimbabwe, they've been using the Sinovac and Sino stuff like that from China. Is that a reason for someone to worry in Africa that there could be some safety concerns regarding this vaccine? So those are my two questions. Thank you. Okay. Vasha, can I can I can I take these questions? Hello. Hello, Vasha. Yeah, yes, you can, Peter. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So, yes, um, you are right that most of the vaccines that we have, and you know that COVID-19 was was a pandemic that needed urgent attention. And so most of the vaccines that we had were vaccines that had been approved on emergency use authorization basis by regulators. That doesn't mean that the, the vaccine did not really go through rigorous process, just that the information that we had was actually scanty. And evidence from Gavi, I hope you know Gavi. Gavi is a global alliance for uh, 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 vaccine and immunization. Evidence from them uh, shows that most of the vaccines that we are going to receive from Africa are going to be vaccines that have been approved on emergency use authorization basis. And that is the reason why we as a people need to strengthen our pharmacovigilance basis. And that is also the reason why we must let our people understand what clinical trials are. I gave an example of the Ebola virus vaccine. When it came to Ghana, Ghana, we didn't have any information on, on the vaccine. And that was the reason why we wanted to conduct phase three trials on the Ebola vaccines in 2015, but it couldn't come on. If we had conducted the trial here, we could have generated safety data in our setting. And so if we have emergency use authorization or we, we have a vaccine that doesn't have enough information, then we need to up our game as far as pharmacovigilance is concerned. Because we are going to apply it wider in our population. And because of that, we must be on the lookout for any adverse uh, event that pops out. We need to be vigilant on that. That doesn't mean emergency use authorization doesn't mean the product is bad, but the information on the product is scanty because the situation is an emergency and requires uh, urgent attention. We need to do something to keep the situation to achieve um, 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 what we call it, to reduce the spread of the infection. infection. Okay. And that is the reason why sometimes the vaccines come out quite quickly. And we need to gather more information on that. And then you talk about some vaccines not being accepted uh, elsewhere. I think those ones are regulatory issues because every regulator has its way of going through every pharmaceutical intervention, okay, to approve it. So the fact that those institutions or those countries don't accept those vaccines or those uh, immunizations as authentic doesn't mean that they are not bad, they are bad in themselves. But rather, those vaccines have not gone through the rudiments of their drug approval process. All right. But if we have done that and think that it is good for us, it is not bad to apply it. So that should not be a way, or that should not give anybody the license to become an anti vax or if people have doubts in their minds, we as healthcare professionals must educate them on some of these things. But regulators differ. There are some drugs that are approved by the European uh, Medicines Agency or the Healthcare and Regulatory Products Agency in the UK. Meanwhile, those same products are not accepted by the FDA in the USA. Those things are regulatory uh, differences across regions that we need to understand and respect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, 
sorry, Prof. Is there, I don't know. Is there anyone still with a question? Otherwise, we would move to close. And I think mm -hmm. I think I it is. I I personally I am helped much with you know Rwanda's presentation. There, I know I'm. I'm more of a mandatory vaccination drive person, <laughs> but <laughs> I think, you know, what, what Dr. Petra said will, will help me, you know, maybe change some of my ways, the way I see it when it comes to this public health intervention. I think I need to learn more also on the motivational, you know, kind of thing, doing it. So I, I don't know, you can, you can close version. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, I just want to say thank you to everyone that joined us today. Like I said in the beginning, I know it's late in the day and everyone is probably tired from work, but we seem to have pulled a decent number of people for our first seminar. I mm -hmm. think it would be helpful, Amos, if you would maybe submit some kind of platform where people could yeah, yeah, perhaps yeah, definitely. request. Definitely. Uh, uh, yeah. Possible. Definitely. I, 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 let, let, me put an email. Let, let me put an email for the symposium. Yeah, that the email up in the chat box there. Uh, I think it, it, it will do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to log out. Thanks you once again, Dr. Murume, for, like I said, providing us this platform and actually bringing us all together. Okay, Take so, care, sorry, I, I, need, I need to put the, I, 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 yeah, okay, sorry. I, I, I wanted they can see you. Thank you, Vasha. We can close. It's fine. It's okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank Please you make everyone. sure you join us again for the next seminar. I think uh, Amos will be posting up the date for that. Right. Bye bye. Thanks, Vasha. Bye. Take care, bye. Uh, thank you, Petra. <laughs>